So welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. And yeah, I would like to start a new chapter, a new section today, but uh, it's not really a completely new topic. I would like to continue our discussion on the discrete forward rate term structure models by discussing the calibration of the model. Yeah? So we are uh, to some extent still in our section on the discrete forward rate term structure model. So an interest rate model that is very rich, that models the full interest rate curve. And today I like to focus on the question, how to calibrate the model. So calibrate the model means how to choose how to choose the model parameters, the free parameters. So if you go back to our section where we started presenting the model, so there were two different versions, you know, either that one or that one. So we have a very rich model and the three parameters, the model parameters here are the initial value, the volatility, and the correlation. So I already mentioned in this setup that actually we have a model framework. So there is something like a model within the model. By now choosing how we choose these um, parameters, for example, sigma is um, a function here, you see, that depends on time and can also depend on L. Yeah. So is it a piecewise constant function? Is it a, a parameterized function? That's somehow like a model within the model. So how we choose the three parameters. So calibration is the choice of the three parameters and the choice of the three parameters are for us the initial value, the forward rate curve, the initial value of the stochastic processes, the volatility parameters, and the correlation parameters, both could be functions of time, of simulation time. They could also be local volatilities, for example, functions of the stochastic process. They could also be stochastic processes of their own. In the other formulation, we combined sigma and rho to our factor loadings, so the lambda ik. Uh, in this set up here, I will go back to the other interpretation of volatility and correlation uh, because we also um, need to understand how the parameters act. And for this, it is better to separate this uh, lambda IK, this factor loading into volatility and correlation. First remark, you see that we have really a huge number of three parameters. So if I discretize my forward rate curve into N periods, for example, the model runs for 40 years, a quarterly model, so I have four periods in the quarterly model, four periods uh, for every year. So I have four times four, 40, I have 160 periods. So I have 160 initial values, 160 volatility functions. Okay, the first forward rate is fixed, so maybe it's 159. And I have a matrix yeah, of 160 times 160 correlations. Okay, the diagonal is one, yeah, and the matrix is symmetric, yeah, so it is 159 squared half. Okay, so it is um, a huge matrix, yeah, 10,000 correlations, hundreds of volatilities and initial values. And volatilities and uh, correlations are functions of time, yeah, of simulation time. So if you have a simulation time discretization, this again multiplies the number of free parameters. So this is a huge, maybe over-parameterized uh, model. Before I come to this, how do we choose the model parameters? So I have here two possible ways of choosing the parameters. The first one is we could say, let's choose the parameters such that the model reproduces observed market prices. So one way is 
reproduct reproduction of market prices. For example, the volatility is chosen such that the model caplet valuation matches the observed value of a caplet on the market. Another alternative is to do historical estimation. So, for example, we choose the volatility of the forward rate such that it matches the observed movement, the observed volatility of the past realizations of the forward rates. Yeah, so which of the two approaches uh, should we use? So, the first one is called market implies because the market implies what we choose for the model parameters. The second one are historical estimates. And the two are actually related to whether we are under the measure Q, our risk neutral measure, or whether we are looking at the model under the measure P, the objective measure. Because if you observe a path, yeah, then you have observed the realizations under under P. So if we consider our model under the equivalent Martingale measure and we moved to a QN yeah, by determining the drift, then actually the second approach is not consistent with our application. So if we are here under Q, then historical estimates may be not consistent with our application. And the right way to do it is to calibrate the model parameters such that the model matches market observed values. Okay, why is this? So if we consider our model under Q, then our aim is to evaluate the financial derivatives by determining the value of a replication portfolio, so hedging. So if I like to determine a replication portfolio, that replication portfolio, of course, consists of products that I trade on the market. So the replication portfolio has to be set up from market-traded products traded at current market prices. So if the model did not reproduce these product prices, then the value of the financial derivative, which should correspond to the value of the replication portfolio, yeah, would not represent the correct value that I need to create, yeah, to set up this replication portfolio. So the model price would be would be wrong. So whenever I observe a market traded product, which I will use for my replication strategy, then I should calibrate my model to this observation. On the other hand, it may happen that I do not observe a product that allows me to fix the model parameter. So for example, if you only observe at the money options, you do not observe the volatility smile. So you actually do not observe on the market if you have a log normal model or a normal model. So we have an example later in the lecture um, on this. So it could be that you have to make a choice, you know, which model you use. Yeah? And in that case, a historical estimate could serve as um, a fallback. Yeah. So in practice, it may be difficult or impossible to derive all parameters from market prices. For example, there is low liquidity in a certain market. And then in that case, um, you could use an historical estimate. So an historical estimate becomes an, an option. Since a model parameter is also a little bit like choosing a different model. Yeah? So you have a family of models parameterized by a parameter. Uh, if you take now this view, it's actually like the choice, 
Do I start with a block normal model? Do I start with a normal model? Or what is the parameter that defines this, this property and how should I choose it? And it may be that you have chosen the wrong parameter. You have chosen the wrong model. So this here is a little bit related to model risk. While the other approach of choosing the parameter to reproduce the market price together with your replication strategy is somewhat neutralizing this risk because you buy this financial product. Yeah, So therefore, it's called risk neutral valuation because you are neutralizing this risk. So you have to consider this residual risk, which is a model risk and maybe you define some risk measure yeah, and check what is the risk and you have some reserve yeah, some 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 capital that covers maybe this this risk another aspect i mentioned that we have a huge set of parameters uh, and there's maybe the risk to have overfitting actually we do not observe so many financial products to determine all 10000 correlation parameters exactly so we should maybe do some kind of parameter reduction. For example, to avoid the risk of overfitting the model yeah, or also um, yeah, to have then a lower set of parameters that we can calibrate to the market instruments. One possibility to do this is to use um, a functional form. Yeah. So, for example, for the correlation, a very simple correlation model that only has one parameter is that we have decorrelation that is exponentially with a parameter A decaying in the distance of the maturities of the forward rates. Yeah? So if I is equal to J, you know, the correlation is of course one, and then it decays if the two forward rates have maturities, have fixings that are further away. Yeah. So when points in the interest rate curve are further away, then they are more decorrelated. If they come closer, they have more correlation. So then you have reduced your parameter set yeah to just a single parameter and maybe the model is now more robust you, you do not fit all the products but you just um, have one parameter to choose and you try to find the best fitting uh, parameter so you already see that this functional form yeah, is like a model within a model so our model is a model framework yeah so 109 so 109 is here my model um, framework. So given that we specified now our model, maybe together with our choice of parameterizations, then the calibration is the inversion of the map from model parameters that enter into our model and the model is maybe then implemented as a Monte Carlo simulation. Then we have the product valuation using our model. And then we would like to match the model valuation to the observed market value of this uh, financial product. And what we need is we need to invert this map. Sometimes it's possible to very easily invert this map, say analytically. So directly saying that if you observe that value, this means that this model parameter should be a function of that observed value. Uh, and sometimes, for example, if you have a low parametric functional form, we can only match or try to fit the observed values in say, for example, some uh, error norm in the best uh, fit 
sense. Yeah? So then maybe we choose a numerical optimization method that changes the model parameters to fit the observed market values. Let's try to discuss our three guys, initial value, volatility, correlation. Let's start with the initial value. So our model is modeling the forward rates and we can observe the forward rates on the market. For example, if we observe on the market zero copper bond prices, so these are now market zero copper bond prices for maturities related to our model tenor time discretization, then we can just calculate the market forward rate from these zero coupon bond prices and choose our initial value to match the market forward rate, you know, the observed uh, market forward rate from these zero coupon bond prices. And we already checked that this will reproduce these zero coupon bond prices. So by that, the model will reproduce the given market zero copper bond prices. This is the case where we have just a single curve set up. Yeah? So there are forward rates, which we calculate from zero copper bonds. Recall that we also had the setup where we introduced a forward rate curve and a separate discount curve. For example, the discount curve was related to collateralization. So the discount factor, the zero copper bond curve is that of a collateral account. And from that we defined the forward rates. So we can also calibrate our model to these two curves by, okay, we observe forward rates, we calibrated a forward rate curve to the market by setting our model initial value to the calibrated forward rate curve that was calibrated to the market. And then if we like to have a different curve for the zero copper bond values for our collateral account, we can use this little trick that we can adjust our numeraire to be consistent with a different discount curve. So we can calibrate also to a collateral curve by taking this to adjust our model zero copper bond price, which is here with the market observe zero copper bond price, which then implies some adjusted, adjusted numeraire. So if we choose this as our initial value and maybe as our discount curve, then our model will reproduce all linear products that use this forward rate curve and this discount curve, at least on our tenor discretization. Yeah? So remember, there is the little constraint that we can calculate the forward rates only on our tenor discretization, and there are payments only on the tenor discretization because we can calculate the numeraire only on that we could try to establish a consistent interpolation, yeah, but that's maybe a topic for a different session. So calibration of the initial values is easy because the model yeah, just models market observed quantities in a certain sense. Yeah, a forward rate is maybe a derived quantities, but once we have calibrated the forward rate curve, we immediately use it as the initial value of our model. Next thing is a bit more interesting, choice of the volatilities. And if you think back to our session on simple interest rate products, so we now ask the question, what are the, in, what are the products that depend on these model parameters? Then clearly 
uh, we could consider the caplet to be the product that we use to calibrate the volatilities. Because if you go back to our model definition, then I had a small section where we had special popular versions, the log normal, the normal, and the displaced log normal model. And you see the log normal term structure model is just a model where each forward rate follows a Black-Scholes model. And there is the Black formula for the valuation of a caplet, which just depends on this volatility function. So let's start by looking at uh, caplets. So a caplet is an option on the forward rate. So consider that we have caplets associated with our interest rate curve discretization, our tenor discretization. So the caplet pays a forward rate, pays maximum of Li minus K and zero multiplied with the period length at the end of the period. So to value this caplet, I need the random variable Li fixed in Ti, the forward rate, and I need the numeraire at the end of the period because that is the payment time. So I can value this financial product in our model. So our model provides these random variables, the forward rates and the numeraire. So for example, if you look now into our code, you can go into our library and look for different product implementations. So you see there are different product implementations. We had a small peak here to the bond and there's a caplet. Okay, and this caplet just does this so it is asking the model for the forward rate and the numeraire, okay? And here it is valuing the forward rate minus the strike floor. So this is maximum of this and zero, okay? Multiplied with the period length. So this code can also value um, a floor led, yeah? So which is just taking the minimum and multiply with minus one. Okay, and then we divide by the numeraire yeah, and we multiply with the numeraire at evaluation time and take the expectation. So we can just value this financial product and try to match these um, values. Well, I already mentioned that we have the Black or black scholes formula if we assume a Black model. And now, assuming that my other model parameters are already calibrated or already fixed, so we have already chosen the initial value of the model by observing a forward rate curve, observing forward rates, and we have chosen by that the zero copper bond prices, yeah, or we have a separate zero copper bond curve. Then if we consider a caplet with a certain strike K, and a certain maturity, Ti, so Ti is given, K is given, the forward rate is already given, and our pay of unit, the zero copper bond, is already given. Then if you consider a black model, the only free parameter is the black Scholes volatility. So we have here the black volatility. So now I can, instead of observing on the market the price of such a caplet, I can calculate the corresponding market implied black volatility from this market price. So this is just to recall the concept of an impact Applied volatility. Likewise, you can do the same thing for the Bachelier model, in which case you use the Bachelier formula to obtain the Bachelier implied volatility for the market price. 
So instead of asking how do I have to choose my model parameters to match the caplet price that I observe, I could also move to implied volatilities and ask how do I have to choose the model parameters such that the implied volatility calculated from my model price matches the implied volatility observed on the market or calculated from the market price. So this is just that I change actually the quantities that I would like to have matched. Yeah? It looks a little bit equivalent. However, um, calibrating two volatilities may introduce uh, an advantage or um, create a difference in the calibration. So choosing the model parameters such that the model reproduces the corresponding implied volatilities may have an advantage or it may create a desirable difference in the cal calibration. The advantage is that there may be an analytic mapping from model parameters to implied volatilities. Well, I already have such a mapping for a very special version of our model. So if our model is, for example, here the log normal version, and if this parameter here is a constant, then this is just the black Schultz volatility. So it is just the market implied volatility. So I just calculate the implied volatility from the market price. And this would be my constant, which I have to put in here to calibrate the model to this caplet market observed implied volatility. So this is an advantage. Um, if we do not have this, so if we perform, for example, some optimization, and if we go here for um, a numerical procedure, so we change the model parameters, calculate the model price, calculate the implied volatility, and try to minimize um, the error. Yeah. Okay, then um, our choice that we now try to minimize the error on the volatilities, this creates a different weightening of the financial products in the error function. So switching from values, so prices, to implied volatilities changes how products are weighted in the error function. So it may introduce some differences in the calibration. So that's an important aspect, yeah? So sometimes you have to transform your market observed prices to other quantities. Also transforming swaps, observed swap rates to a forward rate curve is also such a transformation, yeah? where you then choose the forward rates as the initial value of our model. So, and here we may uh, convert, uh, for example, caplet uh, prices to caplet implied volatilities. And this allows the calibration of, for example, some of our special versions. So here is what I already mentioned. For the special versions of our model, uh, we can calculate maybe some model parameters immediately from observed market implied volatilities, or we can say, define some constraints on the model parameters. For example, for our log normal version, our model is just a black model, a black Schultz model. So our model parameter is here this function sigma i superscript L of t. Um, the diffusion is sigma i superscript L times L dwi. And we know that in the black formula, there enters only the integral of sigma i superscript L squared integrated up to maturity. So this is 
the integrated variance, the accumulated variance, then we divide by time. So this is the annualized accumulated variance. We take the square root and get the parameter for the plaque Scholz formula, our plaque implant volatility. And this is now the model yeah, parameter. So this is the consistent model implied black volatility. And we need to match this model implied volatility to the one which we observe on the market. So we just have to make sure that this integral has the value which we observe uh, on the market. For example, we could just choose this here as a constant and then this is just our model parameter. So that's a way to calibrate the volatilities to caplet prices. Well, maybe just one caplet per maturity, because you see there's only here the dependency on the I, so on the forward rate, so there's no further um, dependency. So the model is very restricted. But we could do this for all of our model versions. We could also do it for our normal model. So for the normal model, my model parameter is just here, this sigma i superscript n. And I also can calculate now the Bachelier implied volatility from the model parameters. So the model Bachelier implied volatility from my model parameters by integrating the square, dividing by the time, taking the square root, and then match the model implied volatility to the market observed implied volatility to reproduce the market observed caplet price. And of course, the same for a displaced log normal model yeah, where your model parameter is now the sigma i superscript d. You can also calculate this model implied displaced log normal volatility, which is associated with a displaced black Schultz formula. And then again, you match the model parameter to the market parameter, market observed implied volatility. Okay, you see that in some cases, there are calibrations, like for example, for the initial value or the caplet implied volatility that are just that I can observe the corresponding model parameter. But the example with the volatility was very restricted. Yeah, I already mentioned that we just have a single uh, maturity pair forward rate. So this is that you just have for a given maturity, we can fix one strike K and calibrate the model to the caplet of that strike K, say K star. And all other caplets are then given. So this will imply the value for all other strike, strikes K not equal k star. So I can observe one caplet per maturity ti. If I choose, for example, a constant volatility in, in my model. So this is now viewing the caplet as a function of the strike. So viewing different prices for different strikes. This function that maps K to implied volatility is called the volatility smile because sometimes it looks like um, a smiling, a smiling shape. So the models that we have considered, yeah, they can only calibrate to a single caplet product per maturity. And then they have a model inherent volatility smile, they have different volatility smiles and maybe you have choose the model yeah, that matches the desired volatility smile. 
Another dimension is that we say we have maybe a fixed strike and we look at the caplet for different times. Okay, so now I look at the caplet for different times. So my map goes from I, which forward rate, to Ti, so the fixing of the forward rate, and I look at the implied volatility for the different times. And now I would like to calibrate my model to the different caplets I observe for the different maturities. So I running from one to n minus one. So there are two different approaches. If you go back, for example, to one version of our model, well, you could choose this as a constant. The constant is gen just uh, the black implied volatility. And you have a different constant for each forward rate. That would calibrate the term structure of the volatility. So the time dependency, yeah, so the maturity dependency of my implied volatilities. But of course, everyone comes here with a single strike. Yeah, I could choose a different strike for each maturity, for example, the at the money strike, yeah? um, but there is just a single strike. So I can choose um, a constant model volatility for each forward rate, namely the implied volatility that corresponds to this maturity and this selected strike to calibrate um, one caplet per maturity. But now in my model, I could also go a different route. I could take one single function, say sigma bar, that defines the model volatility used for all forward rates. So how do I do this? Uh, I set the sigma i of t as the sigma bar of ti minus t. So ti, capital little ti minus t. So you see that the function is here parameterized backward in time. So this means if you have, for example, the maturity ti, then your sigma bar goes backward in time like that. If you have the maturity, say, tj, you have the same function sigma bar that goes here backward in time. So maybe these two sections here are the same, but then the other one has a part that is not entering in the valuation of the caplet. Yeah? So the caplet with maturity tj can be calibrated by choosing this part here. So the caplet that matures in TI can be calibrated by choosing that part here, yeah? okay, which is the same part from zero to TI. So you could choose a single function and just because every caplet has a longer maturity, it will consume more time from that function. Uh, you can, you have a free parameter to calibrate caplets of different maturities with a single time dependent function. This is a very nice model. It's a time homogeneous uh, function. It only it depends on the time to maturity. And yeah, the rule to define a piecewise constant function sigma bar is here. Yeah, So you calculate the integrated variance, the integrated variance up to ti minus one. So this is what you have already used to calibrate all the caplets up to ti minus one. And then for the next period, you just calculate the difference of this integrated variance and 
your integrated variance from the implied volatility. So that is implied volatility squared times Ti. Uh, and you just take this as the additional variance for the time step from Ti minus one to Ti. So you just add the right amount of variance to this function to calibrate the next caplet. Well, there has to be some consistency yeah, um, among the product. Yeah? So um, a later product cannot have a too low volatility. Yeah? Otherwise, this calibration would not work. But uh, usually, this, this, this is possible. So that would be a way that we can also calibrate different maturities for the caplets. Let's do some nice um, numerical experiments now. So first thing is, let's try to verify that if I start with a log normal model, so I have a log normal term structure model, and we choose as our model parameter, say a constant, then we recover that if we calculate the implied volatility from our model price, we recover that constant. So we recover the black implied volatility. So in my experiment section, I just continue where we left off in the last sessions. So what we already did is that we plotted here uh, forward curves. We tested the zero copper bond prices we tested the forward rates, and now we come to um, caplets and check their relation to volatility. So I have a small experiment here. Let's have a look. Recall we have our little model factory. Our little model factory creates our Monte Carlo simulation of our big term structure model. So here we selected a few parameters we would like to use to play with. And yeah, we built uh, the initial values. We uh, built the volatility and correlation models. And we put everything into our Euler scheme with a Brownian motion and create a Monte Carlo simulation. So we have a few parameters at hand here. Initial value is 5%. It's a semi-annual model, runs up to 20 years. Yeah, So we have 40 forward rates. Um, I start here with a volatility parameter of 30%. And it is a log normal model. Yeah, So we had this parameter here that interpolates between a log normal model, zero is log normal, and a normal model, one is normal. Um, there is perfect correlation between all forward rates. Yeah, So there is no decay in our correlation. So it's a one factor model. So what I would like to do is under terminal and spot measure, um, create this model and then value caplets for the maturity T equals five, but different strikes. Yeah? So this here is my, my K. So the line that I have to do to value this financial product is really short. I create this caplet. So the code that we have seen before. So I created for a given maturity period length and strike. So T, this is 0 0.5, half year, and strike. So this is the code we had here. And I just call this valuation code with our model. So it will just do the Monte Carlo simulation. Do the option on the forward rate divided by the numerator. Take the expectation. Then I convert this to implied volatility. So I need the zero copper bond. So we need the P T I plus one. And I use just my model to calculate the zero copper bond. So I create a bond with maturity at 
T plus delta T, yeah, so this is my Ti plus one, yeah, if this here is my Ti. And then I just calculate numerically my zero copper bond value. The same for the forward, I calculate here numerically the forward rate. So this is my Li. And then I plug all this in into a Black-Scholes implied volatility function. So if you go to this function, you see that what he is doing is he is using some numerical root finder here, Newton's method, to do an inversion of Black-Scholes formula. So that's it. Then I do this for all strikes. Uh, and I plot the function, the implied volatility as a function of the strike. Yeah, let's run this um, a little experiment. Okay, and I get these two pictures yeah, for terminal measure and um, spot measure. Okay, so let's have a little bit a closer look. First observation is that we really reproduce as implied volatility our 30%, yeah? So we see that we are here really around the 30%. There is a little bit a numerical error or an error yeah, on the side. So we are a bit too high here and we are a bit too low here. So why is that? Okay, so these are the regions where the Monte Carlo simulation has very few sample paths. Huh? So we have some diffusive process. So this is actually a Monte Carlo error. Okay, and also on the other side. Huh? If you compare now the terminal measure to the spot measure, you see that here, the error looks a bit smaller. If we compare this to the terminal measure. So why is it larger here? Yeah, this is because terminal measure has a negative drift. So there will be even fewer sample paths on this region. Compared to spot measure, which has a positive drift and which pushes more sample paths to the region of high, high interest rate. So also then, this here, if it is a negative drift, should be maybe a little bit smaller. Yeah, this effect is not so 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 prominent. Yeah, maybe it will be more prominent if you move here further to the lower interest rates. But we verify that our model reproduces here the right implied volatility. So you have the code of our experiment also here in the script. So you see what we do is the first step is the Monte Carlo valuation. And we also do a Monte Carlo valuation of the zero copper bond price because we just need this from the model and also the forward rate. And then we perform a conversion to the Black Scholes implied volatility of this price, yeah, of this model. Model value of our caplet. So we get out the 30% that we have put in here. Yeah, so you can also change this maybe to a 20. And we get now more or less an implied volatility of 20 out of our of our model. 
So we can use this parameter here to calibrate our model to caplets. And if it is just a cons constant, yeah, calibration is actually uh, trivial. If we have a log normal model or a normal model, it's just black or bushel J implied volatility that we have to plug in there. However, if you go to the code, you see that I did the code very general because we can create here any model we like. And these steps, the Monte Carlo valuation, the calculation of the model zero copper bond and the model forward rate just work for any model which we choose here. So we can also choose now a Bachelier model and calculate the Black Scholes, Black implied volatility. Let's try that. So what I do is I change my model now to a normal model. So I just say here one and run the experiment again. Okay, and now you see, I do not get back my 30%. Well, there is one strike where you get back the 30%. Yeah, and actually it is around here, our initial value, the 5% where we get this. But for other strikes, our implied volatility now is no longer flat, which means that the model is not a black Scholes model. I would have expected a flat volatility. Uh, what happens if I vary this parameter here between zero and one? So I have a separate numerical experiment for that. This is here, test caplet smile for log normal to normal. Well, the code is very similar, except that now on the outside, I have another loop and this loop runs now from zero to one yeah, in steps of 0 0.1. So it is moving from log normal to normal. And then it's performing the same calculation. Yeah, calculate the caplet for different strikes. And the plot that we will generate will now plot all these uh, curves in the same graph. So let's run this guy. Okay, so we get this picture. So the red curve is the log normal one. Yeah, the parameter is zero, which is almost my flat 30%. And the green curve is parameter one. So which is my normal model. And in between I have my blended, my displaced model, my interpolated model. So let's discuss this. So we have the red line is the case alpha equals zero. This is the log normal model. Yeah, we get a flat line because the log normal model produces the correct log normal implied volatility. And the green line is my alpha equals one, my normal, my normal model. And in between we have curves where alpha is moving from zero, zero to one. So the model that we are investigating here is this one. So we have in interpolation for alpha equals zero, sigma i, L i d w i. So alpha equals zero is my log normal model. And Alpha equals one is L I zero sigma I D W I. So just a constant. So you see that we had this thing that I place here L I of zero, which is just a constant to have roughly the same scaling as we would have for alpha equals zero. Yeah. So if interest rate do not move a lot, yeah, so then these two co coefficient, Li zero times sigma i and 
L i of t, sigma i, are the same if L i of t does not vary a lot. Yeah? So I have this guy here just to have the right scaling. Otherwise, we would have had to change the sigma i parameter to get a matching curve. So that we have this scaling here is actually is the guy that is responsible for the fact that at our initial value, so when rates do not move a lot, so which means when I'm around my initial value, the two curves cross. Yeah? So the two curves cross because at this point, we compare Li of zero sigma i of t w i of t, we compare that, the normal one, to the log normal one, the li of t sigma i of t dw i of t. Okay, so this scaling here is responsible that the two curves have at the initial value roughly the same level. But now, why do we have this tilt? Yeah, we can explain this tilting. Okay, so why do we have here this tilting? By looking again at this diffusion part. So the diffusion part of the normal model. So the diffusion part of the normal model is Li of zero, sigma i of t, dwi of t. So this is the diffusion part of my normal model. Well, my log normal model has an li in front. I just put this li in front. It's an li of t. So that would be a log normal model. If I would like to have that this is now a normal model, then I have to divide by Li of t. So you see, if you interpret the normal one as a log normal one with a different local volatility function, so this is now my local volatility function, then you have that this function here becomes large if Li of t becomes small. So I'm here in the region where interest rates are small, so the volatility becomes large. So this means I can use the alpha to calibrate actually the slope of the implied volatility curve. So it's a first order calibration to the implied volatility SMI. Yeah? Sigma is the level, the alpha gives me the slope. Okay, so maybe now we have a good understanding for the caplet well, and also for its dependency on the strike. I also mentioned that we could look at the caplet for different maturities. Let's do that as the next numerical experiment. So I fix one strike and I look at caplets at different maturities. So the strike that I fix is just the initial value. So this is also called the at the money strike. It's just the forward rate. And we look at different maturities. So this is my next one in the list. I comment that guy out here. And I would like to test the caplet at the money implied volatility for different maturities. So it's actually the same code here inside. Okay, so I calculate the Black-Scholes 
implied volatility from my model value of a caplet. But now I fix the strike to be the forward rate and I run over different maturities. Okay, and I plot the implied volatility as a function of um, maturity. So let's run this experiment. Okay, and we observe the flat 30% for all maturities. Okay, so this is my volatility. Okay, so this is what we get out. Okay, my model allows actually to calculate fractional forward rates. So forward rates that do not lie on my tenor discretization grid. So we had a session, what we can do. So recall that we can interpolate the fractional forward rates if we know the short period bond. So this gap that was in our model, yeah. then we can calculate forward rates on arbitrary periods TS to TE, where the starting point does not lie on my tenor discretization and also the end point does not lie on the tenor discretization. My implementation has a yeah, rudimentary interpolation that allows this. So you see what you have here is just that all the maturities, so maturity actually here means the fixing. So it's the exercise time of the caplet. So this is here from 0.5. This is here 1.0 and so on. All these lie on my tenor discretization. I could try to generate the same picture with a finer step. Yeah. So here I have a parameter maturity step and my parameter maturity step is just running in half years, which is consistent to my tenor discretization. We could run in finer step. So let's run maybe in 0 0.01. And I also value caplets on forward rates that are interpolated. Okay, and I get this ugly picture with some kind of zigzag behavior that somewhat converges. Okay, what's that? So clearly you see my model has some kind of gap and maybe it's fixing this gap not in a very good way. So let's discuss shortly this picture. Yeah, what's happening is that I have a caplet and my model provides forward rates on this discretization. And now I would like to have a forward rate that is not aligned with this discretization. The forward rate has still the period length 0.5, but the fixing is not aligned. So what I have to do is I have to interpolate this forward rate maybe from two others, say this guy and that guy. Yeah, but my stochastic process simulates only in discrete steps. So I can now choose what is the simulation time at which I fix this forward rate. Well, know that here I should fix this red guy here, but at that time, this rate here does not exist anymore. Yeah? It's fixed. So what I can do is I can just round my simulation time down to the fixing of this first forward rate here. And this means that I lose a little bit volatility. Well, 
I lose this volatility if I perform this interpolation using a model for my short period bond. If this short period bond is deterministic. Uh, is a deterministic function of the forward rate, which I observe here at this beginning. So this relates back here to our short period bond. And it's actually this part here that is not stochastic in my model. I just perform some simple interpolation and I round to the previous simulation time. So you see also that this zigzag The zigzag pattern has the width of just one period, because if this guy here is then moved, that he is now aligned again with the period discretization, uh, then I jump to a simulation point where I already have a rate that is fixed. We could a little bit improve this to use for the interpolation for the second rate, the fixing the simulation time, the, the larger simulation time point, uh, when, yeah, say, for example, we are close to it. Yeah? That means the first rate is fixed earlier than it should, but the second rate is fixed later than it should. Yeah? So this by second rate, I mean this guy here. So I could use this simulation time here for the second rate. Say, for example, when I'm close to it, yeah, closer than to the first fixing. This will, okay, I have two rates I'm using for interpolation, and one rate is getting a little bit more. Yeah, This will uh, fix it, but only by a quarter, because the other rate is already um, uh, the other rate is fixed too early. So if I round now to the nearest simulation time, to the nearest simulation time discretization point, okay, then um, after 0 0.25, I have a small, a small correction. Okay, so you see the zigzagging is get, getting smaller. Why is this curve uh, converging? So why is the error getting smaller? Yeah, this is because there is volatility lost here, but there's also volatility that we have up to there in my integrated variance, yeah, and the ratio of the error to the stuff that we do correctly is getting smaller. So it doesn't play such a big role that we miss here the small part of volatility if we already accumulated a large part of volatility in the past. Okay, so that was my tour to through calibrating to Kepler's, and maybe we have a nice first understanding for um, the volatility parameter in our model. Yeah, and now comes an even more interesting part, uh, calibrating to swaptions. We will do this in the next session, but maybe let's start with a small uh, teaser. You could think that, okay, we calibrated now the volatility function to Keplets. So the variance of the forward rates is maybe determined by the Keplet. Uh, this makes sense because I have a nonlinear function, maximum of something minus k and zero on the forward rate. This depends on just the forward rate and it depends on the variance of the forward rate. If you look at the swaption and if you recall what a swaption is, then a swaption is an option on the swap rate and the swap rate is a function of my forward rates. 
Yeah? It's also a function of zero cobalt bonds, but the zero cobalt bonds is then again a function of forward rate scan. So it is a nonlinear function of some sum of forward rates. So it looks as if while the Kepler is sensitive to the variance, the swaption is sensitive to the covariance of the forward rates. The swaption depends on the covariances of the forward rates. And from that, you might think, okay, let's calibrate the swaption to the correlation, so our rho ij. And the funny thing is that I can calibrate all swaptions even if we have a one-factor model with perfect uh, correlation. So I have a very nice numerical experiment at the end of this session on the swaption calibration, where we observe that even in a one-factor model, if you look at the correlation or the covariance, if you like, of two different forward rates, then you would expect perfect correlation because everything is moving in parallel. But I have a trick that allows to create in a one-factor model perfect decorrelation of two forward rates. And we can use this trick to calibrate all swaptions that exist on our tenor discretization. So this is a full full matrix. Let's do that in the next session. That was it for today. Thanks.